Okay, welcome everyone to Recognizing Misophonia, an Extreme Emotional Response to Common Stimuli. Uh, this, um, this is the last of seven um, meetings that we've, we've had, uh, last of this, the eighth of, had seven before this. And so um, we're gonna cover the history of misophonia, presenting symptoms, what we see, Mesophonic trigger stimuli, selectivity and intermittent nature of triggers, the emotions of misophonia, the physical uh, responses of misophonia, age of onset, prevalence, comorbidity, uh, misophonia versus other conditions, and uh, a little bit about misophonia management. So I'm glad you all, everyone that's uh, here today, have decided to uh, participate. And uh, let's see what. Uh, Let's see what we have. So in 1997, audiologist Marsha Johnson, who had a tinnitus treatment clinic, um, called, noticed this similarity of uh, basically mostly teenage girls that were coming, being brought to her, who had this extreme response to some soft sound, to chewing sounds or breathing or sniffing. But they had this inability to tolerate these sounds. And she noticed that they didn't have a hearing problem. They didn't have any psychiatric conditions to, that presented themselves. It was just this extreme inability to tolerate very specific soft sounds. And so she called it soft sound sensitivity, sensitivity syndrome, which was later also called selective sound sensitivity syndrome or 4S. And she brought this to the attention of the Astroboss who publish and present a lot more and they named it misophonia. Miso meaning hate or dislike, and phonia meaning the sounds. And misophonia was viewed as an auditory phenomenon and the treatment you know, domain of audiologists for about 15 years. And it, before we had this uh, article that was published in the New York Times titled, When a Chomp or a Slurp is a Trigger for Outrage. That was a great article that brought a lot of public awareness to this condition. And then a couple of years later, we started seeing the first uh, studies of misophonia uh, published, one by Marin Edelstein and the uh, people at the University of California, San Diego, uh, Misophonia, Physiological Investigations and Case Descriptions, and one by Arjan Stroder uh, in University of Amsterdam, Misophonia Diagnostic Criteria for a New Psychiatric Disorder. We'll talk more about some of those later. But that was that was really the, the start. So what, is, what does it look like when a person comes with misophonia? What, what do you see if a person in your classroom or your clinic comes in with, and has misophonia? We're well, gonna see that there's an unwillingness to tolerate specific stimuli. We call these misophonic triggers. They're gonna be hyper-focused on these triggers and the source, who's making them, when they might happen. And they may even hear sounds that others cannot hear. They're going, ooh, that's, stop that. Stop the, somebody's, you know, doing something or there's some sound. You go, I don't hear anything. Well, the reason is that they're hypersensitive to these sounds and they can hear things that others don't hear because their brain is very cued in to those specific stimuli. Um, individuals with misophonia are going to have an inability to concentrate. So in a classroom, they're going to be very distracted. Uh, make them stop that. Make them quit. Uh, they, they will often have anxiety and stress when they're entering a situation where they may have triggers. This is not an anxiety disorder. This is natural concern because they're going to be entering an area where there's something unpleasant. They're going to try to avoid these situations where there may be triggers. And when the triggers occur, they're going to try to get away from it. They're going to make, try to make it either stop or they're going to want to leave. And if they can't do make the trigger stop or they can't leave, then they're going to endure these triggers with, with distress. And you're going to see aggressive behaviors. You're going to see that there's a verbal demand, sometimes physical aggression, especially with younger children, to try to stop the trigger or to get away from the, the trigger stimuli. 
And you'll notice that the behavior is really uncharacteristically harsh with these individuals. That, you know, they may be soft and sensitive little child who's cooperative, but when it comes to a trigger, they are not co cooperative and they are going to do anything they can to stop it. Now, this, these responses can be very extreme. Usually there's not an acting out of a physical response, but this is a case of an individual where Lenny Mordarski is the 67, 68 year old man. And he was on a Southwest flight going from Chicago to Manchester, New Hampshire. And uh, he went to sleep. And before the plane ever took off and he started snoring and the woman that was sitting in the seat beside him, 64 years old, she took a ballpoint pen and she stabbed him in the arm <laughs> and created quite a stir. Um, Lenny screamed like a little girl and uh, they, they took him, took the plane back to the, uh, to the gate. They took the lady off the flight. They did a little questioning of people of what had happened. Flight went on to Manchester and the woman was put on a later flight. There were no charges, but it was just all that she, it was more than she could handle. It was just more than she could handle. So this happens. So um, the presenting conditions, what are you going to actually see? Well, you may in fact see um, the, the fact that the, the person is having some level of hearing something and then there's an outward behavior. They say, Sue, stop that. Or they leave, get up and leave the room. Or they may, in some cases with younger children, they may just start hitting. So there's an outward, an overt behavior. You may have them to uh, express some level of anger or disgust. Oh, I hate that sound. Arr, don't do that. And then, of course, there's going to be that outward behavior that you're seeing. And then misophonia is normally viewed as a situation where there is a, a stimulus, a trigger. There's this anger or disgust response, but it also can include other emotions. I'll mention those in a minute. And then there is this distress response. This was documented by Marion Edelstein, that they're, they're having this form of physiological distress. And then there's some outward behavior of them dealing with the situation. Talking about auditory triggers, the auditory triggers uh, are the most common. People sometimes even say misophonia is a condition where you know people hear certain sounds and they become upset and they give other names to those where they have visual triggers. It's really all the same response. It's all the same problem. And it's much better if we call it a single name misophonia for auditory and visual triggers. Now, misophonia is known as a condition where a person hears somebody chewing and is filled with rage. And in this survey of a thousand people, we found that, you know what, it really kind of deserves that reputation because 96% of the people that took this survey had mouth sounds as triggers. And 83% had breathing sounds as triggers. So between mouth sounds and breathing sounds, I don't know if there was any that don't, there probably are some that don't have either, but a large number of people have these mouth sounds and breathing sounds, again, sniffing, wheezing, you know, such, such loud, any kind of mouth sounds, breathing sounds. But then, and it tapered down toward these other, let's see, there was a 67% with mechanical sounds made by hand, clicking, keyboards and pens and crinkling paper, 59% with foot sounds, 59% with other hand sounds where they're tapping or rubbing. But now notice that it also can be mechanical sounds that are not involving people, clocks ticking, copy machine noise, a phone ringing. Uh, it can be machines in the distance. It can be sounds that are not human sounds, and you can even have other popping, cracking joints, joints popping and cracking. My daughter used to hate the sound of my jaw popping, and it was a pretty distinctive jaw pop uh, when she was a teenager. And then other things, speech sounds and other sounds. So there's really a large variety in the sounds, and we find that uh, 
all kinds of other th sounds like pencil on a paper, flipping pages, uh, pouring liquid into a glass, stirring iced tea. One of the early on when I started studying misophonia, one of the individuals I know said that he couldn't stand the sound of stirring the clink, 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 clink. clink. That was his only trigger. So it wasn't that he had bad misophonia. It wasn't clinically significant. He just was a little irritating when that happened. Or more than a little, he's just like, oh, I can't stand that sound. Uh, we have you know, birds chirping, dogs drinking, static on the radio. Virtually any sound can be a misophonic trigger. So uh, it's not just, we're not all the same. These sounds can, can be, uh, any sound by any person can be a trigger for them, but not a trigger for someone else. So it's very specific to each individual. Everybody has their own set. Now, visual triggers. So uh, in this same survey, we asked the question, do you have any visual triggers? And again, this is still misophonia with a visual trigger, 78% open mouth chewing. Okay, you say, well, that's the sound associated with that trigger, but how about leg jiggling? There's no connection to the eating uh, or mouth or breathing sounds, and yet 47% had triggers to leg jiggling going on down. I find a lot of people that just are very triggered strongly by the jaw movement, especially gum chewing, which is that very repetitive and consistent response, uh, motion. Uh, but then again, hand movements, hair twirling, these are visual triggers that are totally unconnected with uh, the auditory, common auditory triggers. And then looking over the data as I, as I went down and said, who reported at least one visual trigger? 92% of the people had at least one visual trigger. And so the triggers are, are everywhere. And it's, again, this is all misophonia. And one of the ones I'm hearing, seeing popping up more often now is a person like scrolling a cell phone. But that, that triggers a person. Or, you know, person rubbing their eyes, crying a little bit. Uh, one, one, one person touching the face or the jaw. I apologize if I've triggered some, some of you. I would hope you would close your eyes. One boy, restroom sign. Okay. So. What other, other triggers, feeling a vibration, somebody bumping a desk in an open office, um, or bumping the, the wall of a cubicle or shutting a drawer, the person that has that shares the common cubicle wall, odors, uh, touched by another person, the vibration that you feel in your chest from low uh, bass sound. And there are unusual triggers. There's things like one person was triggered when people speak while they're inhaling. And would anybody do that? Well, yes, yes. Some people can speak when they're breathing in and then continue on. I find that's an Irish thing. Lived in Ireland for a while and the people did, did that occasionally. Uh, incorrect grammar by close family members, casual singing, foreign accents, two televisions at the time. Virtually any repeating sight, sound, or other sensation can be a misophonic trigger. And again, this is all misophonia. Now, how about something that's loud and irritating, like a crying baby? Well, that can go both ways. So if you're on an airplane and there's a baby in the, the, the row behind you and the baby's screaming the whole time and you're going crazy, like, I gotta stop that kid. Somebody need to you know, put a muzzle on that kid. That is a normal reaction to an irritating stimulus. But if a person has a crying baby as a trigger, then they're also gonna trigger the little quiet instances of that of that trigger that are not loud and irritating. Snoring is one that I thought originally, oh, oh that can't be a misophonia trigger. That's just annoying. Uh, but in fact, it can be it, because when it causes this instant anger and this involuntary anger response. I know uh, one individual who didn't have very strong, very bad misophonia, done a very good job of, of managing and reducing it over the years. And uh, he would wake up angry at his wife when she was snoring. And he would just be, oh, oh, she's snoring. Oh, OK, well, <sighs> calm down, you know, maybe put in the earplugs. But that, that anger response kicked in. Same thing for dogs barking. 
Okay, triggers are what we call a con complex stimulus. So it includes the, the situation, the setting, the context, the social expectation, and the specific stimulus, which may be a visual stimulus, an auditory stimulus, or may actually be both. Now, to show you the example of the context nature of a stimulus, I want you to think of the lion that roars on the start of the MGM movie. And this won't be great, but let's see what we get here. You'll get a little bit of this. Went the wrong way on that. Okay. Right? And you go, hey, the movie's gonna start. Great, right? Well, or nothing. So I want you to imagine, close your eyes and imagine you're in a tent in the forest at two o'clock in the morning. It's quiet all around and you hear. Right? Would you have a different response? Well, yes, absolutely you would. It would trigger a fear response. And so the context, the stimulus is exactly the same, but the context is different. And so that makes a big difference as to whether you're triggered or not. Uh, another uh, example of this in real life misophonia is uh, a person may be triggered to the chewing sounds of their brother, but not to other sounds, not to other chewing sounds. Now, sometimes that's the specific difference, and I'll talk about that in the sound, and sometimes it's the context. I was working with a woman who was triggered to the sound of kids playing outside. And so we were using video chat like this and we were going along and, and she goes, just a minute, I think there's kids playing out behind my house. And she said, I said, are you being triggered? She goes, yes. So she went off and then she came back. She says, oh, it's uh, there's some construction work going on. It's not a problem. So the same stimulus when she realized it was workers, not a, not a trigger, but when she thought it was children, it was. You find people say, well, uh, my, you know, I trigger at home, uh, but not in public or only the family members and not other. So those triggers are very localized, uh, but sometimes a child will trigger at home, but not in public because it's too embarrassing to respond when they're out in public. And sometimes there are subtle differences in misophonia triggers. And those subtle differences can, can make the difference. So uh, if you think of a child's name as William, he could be called William or Billy or Bill, but when he was called Bill, there'd be a meltdown. And when he was called Billy or William, there would not be. And so that's an example where the specific stimulus, Bill, not the meaning, his name, was a trigger. I worked with a man who developed a trigger to the California mo Mockingbird, which is the northern Mockingbird. There's only one in all the United States. Same variety everywhere. And uh, he had a pair of Mockingbirds build a nest outside of his bedroom window. Now, isn't that sweet? Oh, I have little birds outside my window. The only problem is that the male mockingbird chirps 24 hours a day during certain times of the year. And so it's like, he's trying to go to sleep and he's hearing this and it's just like, oh, you know, and he developed that as a misophonia trigger. Now, he would trigger to that bird, but not other birds in the area. And when we went online to YouTube to listen, to try to get a copy of the, of the trigger, we found that he would trigger very specifically to the local mockingbird calls, which was different than the calls in other areas of the United States. He go, well, that one's close, but that's not quite the same. No, that doesn't trigger me. That one's almost right. It triggered me just a little bit. But the very subtle differences between mockingbirds in Northern California, Bay Area, and those in Texas, New York, didn't the diff, he didn't trigger him. Now, one of the uh, uh, young men I first worked with was a, a teenager and he triggered to his mom's crunchy chewing, but, he, but to mom and not other people, even in his home, not to other people. And so I took, uh, we took, had the boy face the wall over here 
and we took two little fritos the size of my thumbnail, little bitty things. He faced the wall. I put one in my mouth, went crunch. He goes, no, no, that's nothing. Mom put it in her mouth, went crunch. He goes, oh, that's it. And so he could actually hear the difference in mom's crunch and my crunch. Turned out mom was trying to be very careful. And so she was going crunch and I was going crunch and didn't trigger it. Now misophonia usually begins in a, a sing, with a single sound, a single source and a single place. It usually begins at home with a family member and that's where we have the most experience. And then it tends to spread or generalize as we say and these are different newly acquired triggers that the sounds made by other people you know uh, become start becoming a trigger and maybe a different source maybe a different setting similar sounds become triggers and then stimuli that accompany a trigger become a trigger so if i have a if i trigger to crunching and i have a bag of chips and it's crinkle crunch crinkle crunch the crinkle becomes a trigger that we know uh, neurologically that when stimuli are paired together then they they become have similar responses they can develop that that response and then you a person can develop triggers to completely unrelated stimuli like i, I trigger to chewing sounds and now i'm developing a trigger to hair twirling and that has to do uh, with the ability to just develop these reflexes the emotions of misophonia can be extreme anger anxiety rage disgust wanting to get away these are the most common emotions for weak triggers but people will want to they feel guilt for their feelings they have they feel fear or sadness some people they, they have a trigger they just have the overwhelming sadness in the situation some people want to just lash out verbally physically some people want to just do physical harm they want to hurt the person but it's so strong so misophonia emotions are very real they're very powerful here's the results of a study that we conducted where we gave people very tiny tiny triggers little bitty triggers and they would immediately have these trigger these emotional responses these are emotional reflexes uh, with anger being and anxiety being the, the biggest but you can see that the other ones drop on down. Now these were with tiny triggers and with a real strong trigger, a person may have many more and stronger emotions than we uh, jerked out of the people with, with this. So let's see, uh, before I go into the distress response, I'm gonna try a poll here. And I'm gonna see if, a little bit about our group. So let's, let's open up a poll and have you answer some questions here. So here's a poll. Um, why did it not open the okay, polls? Did I not say select the poll? Okay, do you have misophonia? So that should pop up on your screen and ask, do you have misophonia? So answer that yes, no, or maybe. And let's see how it goes. So we've got uh, mostly no, the no's and yes. There's a tough race between no's and yes and a maybe. And we're gonna close the poll now. And we see that um, if I share this poll with you, that 42% uh, yes, and 11% maybe, and 49, 47% no, okay? Let's try another poll here. Let's ask the question, do you know someone with misophonia? Let's answer that poll. Let's see how that looks. So we've got people answering. So far we have, 88% voted, and we're going to go ahead and close that there and show the results here. And yes, 82% yes, 9% no, and 9% maybe. Now we're going to go ahead and hide that, and we're going to launch our last poll, which is, are you a clinician or a helping professional of some sort who is uh, looking to learn about misophonia for your the people you you work to help with and we're at about 79 percent voted we're getting very close there we're going to go ahead and close now and share this result and to my delight we have 73 percent of you 
are clinicians and helping professionals. That's wonderful. I'm really delighted that you're taking this opportunity to learn about misophonia here. I'm gonna go ahead and hide that. And then we're gonna go back to our presentation. So this is uh, a study by Marin Edelstein and the people at University of California, San Diego, where they use skin conductance response to measure the, uh, the distress that a person is feeling, feeling. So you have all of these verbal reports of how horrible the misophonia triggers are, and yet there's nothing to prove it. So they measured the skin conductance response, which is perspiration on the skin, which is the same thing that's used for a lie detector test. And you notice the, the blue line here is the people's response who heard a 15 second uh, auditory trigger and the purple, the, the green is for the control group who were hearing the sound. So quite a huge difference. And then for visual trigger, the red is the response for uh, individuals with misophonia seeing a visual stimulus. And the purple is for people uh, who did not have misophonia. And because there was a very low number of people, they didn't have statistical significance, meaning showing statistically that they were different, absolutely, but you can see quite a difference here between the two. And if the numbers were larger, I'm sure it would have had statistical significance. And we do see these strong responses in individuals to their visual stimuli. Okay, a little bit about the brain issues of misophonia. Wonderful study done by Sukhbender Kumar and his colleagues back in 2015, presented at the Misophonia Association Convention in 2015 and it was presented in early 2017 called The Brain Basis of Misophonia in Current Biology. And in this, it shows a, a connection with the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. And that's a little spots behind your eyebrows here, here. And those spots are known to be involved in the emotional, in the regulation of emotions. So it either boosts the emotion or dampens the emotion. And, uh, it's also known to be connected with associative learning of emotions. So a person hears a stimulus and then that develops a positive response or hears a, a repeating stimulus and it develops a negative response. So this is the development of your conditioned emotional response. And what he found is that in non-mesophonic individuals, the anterior insula is computed com communicating with the VMPFC, and it actually reduces or retards the emotional response to those, to those trigger sounds. But with a person with misophonia, it actually boosts and accelerates and magnifies the response to, to individuals with misophonia. So for those who don't have misophonia, you hear the, the crunch and, and your little VMPFC says, this is not the stimulus you're looking for. They call, move along. And for those with misophonia, the BMPFC goes rage and just thrusts it into their brain. So Dr. Kumar's summary as he presented at the conference is in misophonia, misophonic subjects, the connectivity between the BMPFC and anterior insula is positive indicating that the BMPFC rather than regulating is boosting the activity of the anterior insula. Given the role of the VMPFC in learning associations, our data is consistent with the view that aberrant associations represented in the VMPFC drive areas involved in emotion processing. In plain English, that the misophonia emotions are a conditioned emotional response. They develop through experience with the triggers and that these are an emotional reflex. It is an involuntary response, not a controllable, willful response. Now, the top figure shows the general view of misophonia, but there's actually a hidden physical reflex response of misophonia that most people with misophonia do not realize what they have. And I'm going to show you a little uh, video here, and I'm going to do that. I'm going to have to switch over to what we call the fake webcam, which allows me to play a video instead of playing the, the actual, uh, instead of live 
web feed. So here we go. This is going to be uh, a 10 year old. Girl. This is an eight year old girl with misophonia, and this is a demonstration of the reflex that she had on so, October yeah. the 21st. And you'll notice that her shoulder jerks and that her foot jerks when she hears the well, sniffing sound. Shoulder jerk was the reflex, but this is her reflex. See how quickly that responds, how instantly. Just one last bowel movement, that'll be the end of it, okay? Mm -hmm. okay. Y'all relaxed? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that is our nice year old girl with misophonia. Now, and switch back over to the webcam. Okay, so that is a instantaneous, almost instantaneous, response, muscle response for um, this child when she hears a sniff. Now that's a little bit like her getting tasered in her calf muscles, and that is quite a jolt to her system. So um, let's move to the next one. So Kate Morrison and I did this study. Uh, in the one we asked about the emotions, what we really wanted to do is have some documentation of these physical reflexes. And so we had people hear very weak auditory triggers and see equivalently weak visual triggers to keep it very small so that they could pay attention to what's happening in their body. And we found that everyone reported a physical sensation to some of their triggers, at least one. Most reported physical, physical sensations to all of their triggers. And in fact, they were more likely to report a physical sensation, well, I felt something in my shoulders, than they were, and no emotion, than they were to have an emotion and no physical sensation. And if you look down this list on the right-hand side, you know, shoulders, half of the people had a shoulder response coming on down with hands and arms, neck, chest, back, abdomen, jaw, thighs, general tensing, a sexual response, a wave of warmth. Their toes were curling. They felt nauseous. They felt something holding their breath or breathing uh, in their torso, in their head, in their face. There was some physical sensation and some couldn't put a finger on it, what it was, but they knew that they, they felt something, but they couldn't identify it. And this level of this shows that this physical response is most likely a general characteristic of misophonia but these were again were all verbal responses and so to validate this we decided to do another study where we wanted to have the researchers see the response and so and we used electromyography to see if we could measure it and so this is our visual results and what we saw in these three subjects that were chosen specifically because they had physical sensations that they thought we could we would be able to see the muscle. Uh, you know, Abby, once the response was over a two, we would generally see it. And if it was a four or higher, we saw it every time. And for Dave, again, weaker responses we didn't necessarily see, but for stronger responses, we all we would see. So Abby had like a muscle contraction in her back and Dave had a flinch on the back of his neck. But I think those were secondary, like the, the muscle, the shoulder jerk in the eight year old girl that we saw. And so, but Bonnie had a calf muscle flinch that every time she said I was triggered, we saw that muscle flinch. Uh, and we saw it for both auditory and visual triggers. And then we, had the electromyography and let me just explain this chart. So this is a 100 millisecond timing pulse that is not audible, but it was recorded on one of the electromyography uh, channels. And then we had the trigger, and this was, I think a sniff, which the electromyography didn't record because it was too high, but we knew this is when the sniff occurred. Um, and so we would see 200 milliseconds, 210 right out in this case, after the onset of the of the sniff, we had a uh, the deltoid muscle flinch, and a little less than that, we had a calf muscle flinch. So we were seeing and measuring these muscle flinches that happened a couple hundred milliseconds after an auditory stimulus. And for a three second long 
open mouth chewing stimulus, no auditory that she was uh, not hearing this. We can see we have a big pulse spike in the calf muscles and then the paraspinals and deltoids and kind of went up and down as the, the stimulus was going on and then the stimulus stopped. So again, we see very strong muscle responses in, the, in these situations. So our summary, our conclusion here is that misophonia includes a directly elicited physical, usually a muscle flinch or other sensation in the participants. And that I just want to point out that that initial flinch is usually invisible to other people. So you really can't use it as a way of identifying that the person is having a misophonic response. But if you can, uh, it's a way of actually validating or maybe ruling in misophonia instead of ruling out misophonia. There's a large variety of physical responses and this large variety shows that this is not some genetic condition or some inherent reflex condition due to a brain defect. This is a, an acquired, a learned uh, response. So it really supports classical conditioning as a mechanism of developing misophonia. And again, we saw similar responses for auditory and visual stimuli, which indicates that we really should be calling all of this misophonia rather than misophonia for one and some other name for reacting to visual triggers. And so we suggested, um, oh, sorry, I want to say the latency. The latency for the auditory stimulus was 200 milliseconds. Now the latency between stimulus onset for like a startle response, that's going to be much more like 60 milliseconds. So there's enough extra time here that indicates something is going on in the brain. There's some level of processing. And in fact, because of the, that this is a complex stimulus that considers the social expectations and the setting and who's there, that makes sense that it takes longer for this response to, um, to a, a complex stimulus. So we recommended that we conceptualize misophonia as an aversive physical and emotional reflex response. So a little bit about onset of misophonia. Uh, people say, oh, it always happens in late childhood or early teens. Well, this is from a study that we're, we've done where we see that, yes, between nine to 10 was the most common age of onset. And this is adjusted for year that's included in the, uh, in the column. So nine to 10 years, there was nine and a half percent. So there was 19 percent that were reported either nine or 10. But we look out into young adulthood and adulthood. So the 19 to 23, there was 1.1% of the people in the, per year. So five years, that would be five and a half percent of our group reported that they had an onset in the 19 to 23 range. And you see that it continued to develop on out into the, to the 40s and, uh, and 50s so that misophonia is not a condition that only develops in childhood. It can develop in any situation. The man who never had misophonia that developed it to the mockingbirds, he was in his, uh, in his early 30s. And so I think he was, maybe in late 20s or early 30s, but he had never had anything, but he got put in that situation and the misophonia developed. Prevalence of misophonia, far more common than we would, would imagine. Um, when I first started looking into this, I sent out a sample to my list, to my LinkedIn group as a control and took a sample of people that were on the internet. And I was very surprised that misophonia was popping up all over the people that have my LinkedIn, were in my LinkedIn group. And so I, I bought a survey um, of 300 people and I took the, the responses of the misophonia group and the responses of the people that were in the, the purchase survey and I lined them up and then I drew the line and said, okay, everything about here is misophonia. And defining it that way, 15% of my purchase survey had misophonia. Now the astrobofs who have a look at people prevalence coming in at the clinic, and this is probably more severe misophonia, say it should be around 3.2% based on the, the prevalence numbers and some and comorbidities. Uh, Monica Wu and a study using undergraduate psychology students, which are probably 
a bit more neurotic than than the engineering students. So she found tw virtually 20 percent of clinically significant misophonia in that group. And uh, Victoria Cash, um, I think it's Victoria anyway, in her dissertation, uh, she had an 18 percent in undergraduates and a 13 and percent in the community. So I think more like 10 to 15 percent would be a, a more expected normal level in the average adult population in the United States. And there was a 23andMe.com uh, survey, which is that's a, a DNA family ancestry site says, does the sound of others chewing fill you with rage? 19% said yes. So pretty high. And then in a, in a, a population of individuals with uh, psychiatric comorbidity, these were people that were being released, dismissed, or their, their treatment was being ended at this outpatient psychiatric clinic. They took the survey, 66% um, had clinically significant misophonia. And if we look at that, it was, you know, 15% had no sound trigger sensitivity. Um, maybe 18% was subclinical. And then you see mild, moderate, severe, and extreme. Uh, so this comorbidity of misophonia with other conditions is, is quite high. And this is the list. People sometimes say, well, isn't misophonia uh, an, an obsessive compulsive disorder or a sign of sensory processing disorder or a sign of uh, autism, a symptom of autism? Well, we can look and see that, and this is lifetime diagnoses. And then this is what do they think they do they feel like? Do they think they have the condition right now? And so this is subjective to the individual. And so if we look at OCD, 12% said had a lifetime diagnosis, and 17% said, yeah, I think I'm have a compulsive beat disorder. But that says that 83% don't. If I look at sensory processing dis sensory processing disorder or sensory over-responsivity, 5% had a diagnosis. And yeah, 16% said that they thought they had that general sensory sensitivity, but that leaves what? 83 or 4% that don't. And now let's look, look down at autism, 2.5% had the diagnosis, 3.7% felt they had that. Again, that leaves like 96% that don't. So although we have other comorbid disorders, misophonia is not a symptom, not just a symptom, of another disorder. And specifically looking at uh, misophonia versus sensory processing disorder over responsivity. With, with SPD, you find a lot of tactile sensitivity, not in misophonia. You find that they respond to strong or persistent auditory stimuli, car horns, um, alarms, uh, air conditioners running. But with misophonia, it's a response to weak stimuli in specific, very specific context, meaning stimuli. Again, visual stimuli for SPD, it's loud lights, it loud, <laughs> sorry, bright lights, fluorescent lights, um, and for misophonia, it's very specific jaw movement, hair twirling, and food texture exists for, mes for SPD, but not misophonia pretty much. And the, the real issue here is that with sensory processing disorder, it is an innate genetic response. It doesn't require a learning history. Where with misophonia, it requires a learning history of a specific stimulus in a specific situation or this conditioned physical and emotional respondent behavior to develop. Okay. Let's look at look misophonia versus some other disorders. Anxiety disorders uh, include excessive anxiety and worry about various areas of the life. Uh, but with misophonia, there is anxiety, especially about entering an area where there's going to be triggers, but it's focused on the misophonic stimuli and avoiding them. And so there's a real, there's a reason and a focus for that anxiety. With OCD, the compulsive thoughts are persistent and they're repetitive and they're intrusive. Like, oh, I got to go see if the door is locked or the I have to touch that or it's not right or move that. Where with misophonia, there is preoccupation, 
but it's again, it's with triggers and the people associated with those. And with phobias, it's an intense fear about a specific object or situation where misophonia, there is often fear, um, but the emotional response is going to include anger or disgust. I had one lady who said that she had fear as her primary emotion. So I was wondering, you know, is this really misophonia? And uh, she was a very jumpy person who just was easy to startle. And so, um, you know, somebody came up behind her and said, Jane, oh, you know, she would jump. So um, what we found is that her physical, her initial physical reflex was a gasp for air. She would go, so it'd be like crunch. Oh, and, she, and these muscles would jump to breathe. And now she's not choosing to breathe. That it's just happening to her by her autonomic nervous system. And so it's, oh, and then she goes, ah, it scares her. So she learned that if you breathe steadily when she was around triggers, then that jump wouldn't happen so much and, and the fear startle response wouldn't happen. And by the way, she also got angry. So it was really trigger, jump, anger, or sorry, trigger, breath, fear, anger. So she was getting an anger response there too from it. Okay, uh, managing misophonia. Uh, misophonia response increases in severity with real life experience. So you really don't want to tell a person, oh, just tough it out. Get tough with it, face it on. Because if you try to get tough, it's going to become worse because the emotional response is strengthened, the physical response is strengthened, and any repeating stimulus paired with the trigger can become a new trigger. And then, and that anytime a person is distressed, when they start noticing another trigger, another stimulus, then noticing that stimulus and having a distress response and then cause them to have a developed misophonia again to that independent uh, stimulus. So you really wanna avoid enduring situations of misophonia distress. That doesn't mean you avoid all triggers. You just want to avoid this prolonged distress situation. Now you want to add background noise. You've heard the phrase, it's so quiet you can hear a pin drop. Because when it's quiet, your ear turns up the sensitivity, your brain turns up the sensitivity of your ear. And so having the noise reduces the perceived volume of the trigger, makes it less noticeable, and it reduces the fidelity or the clarity of the stimulus. So you're muddling in the sound of that crunch with waves and, and it just doesn't, create as strong of a misophonic response. You can use things like a box fan or a, or a vent fan. In a classroom, if you had a box fan, you can put it up against the wall and turn it on and it won't blow any, any air, but it'll make a lot of noise and you can low, medium and high. Uh, sound machines, open ear headphones with a noise app playing. And I've had cases where the teachers didn't want them wearing the headphones. Here's a, here's a great example. Of an, of an open ear headphone, right? This nice little, look it on the ear. And, and because they wanted them to hear what was going on in class, but misophony distracts their attention so much that when they're being triggered, they can't pay attention at all. And if they have a little noise, a little rain sound or wave sound in their ears, then they can actually pay far better attention to the instructional materials than if they didn't have that sound and we're being triggered. Now, audiologists can provide what's called a sound generator. This is a physical case of a sound generator. It's a hearing aid case, and it's essentially a hearing aid that uh, drops over the ear, goes in the ear, and then it can play a little bit of noise. And I better take that out so I don't sound like I'm louder now. Um, but that noise, uh, again, can be given very uh, discreetly to the ears. You also now with hearing aids can play um, from your, your, your smartphone right into the hearing aid. And so you can play noise on, a, on an app that plays into, the, into their ears. That's again, very good. You can get noise canceling headphones or noise isolating headphones. Again, these are not, we're not trying to eliminate all triggers, but we do not want to have the child to endure busy misophonia physiological distress because that tends to make the misophonia worse and it has a, a prolonged negative effect of, of, of this high level of stress can cause other conditions. I, so you know, stress is not good for our, us. 
So the other thing is, especially for older individual, older individuals, teens and adults, that you can try to relax into the situation where there are triggers and relaxing rather than tensing up makes it hit you lighter. Um, again, we mentioned headphones and noise, trying to reduce the number of triggers. So you want to make a plan in the family as to how to avoid having, especially in the car, you know, if you have a child with misophonia, uh, having them uh, sit in the car while they're going to school and their brother's eating a granola bar on the way to school because they didn't have time to eat at home, uh, or you're having snack time in class and you're, everything's quiet and the kids are crunching on their, their snacks, that's really, really difficult. So you can have them eat separately. Again, in the class situation, turn up some noise, or it's seating in a classroom. You can put all the, the, the kids with allergies and sniffing in one corner of the room and put the, uh, the child with the misophonia in the other corner of the room. Hearing assisted devices with such as a transmitter and a receiver, that's very good for misophonia. And uh, these are normal hearing assisted devices available in all universities. And it's nor a good device to be used for a child who has a hearing uh, problem in a, uh, for ADA accommodations in a, in a classroom. And then again, you wanna allow the child or the individual to escape from their office setting or their classroom and move away where they can calm down, maybe put on their headphones, get a little noise and then move back. So we really, we're not recommending to avoid all misophonic triggers that will destroy the person's life and put more focus on it and make, tend to make things worse. Worse, but we do we do want to be gentle and kind, and we don't want to have expect a person to just get tough and take it take it like a man, you know. Well, that's just going to make that's going to make the misophonia worse. So, recognizing misophonia. In summary, it is an extreme negative response to specific common innocuous stimuli, we call these triggers. Most often it's mouth and nasal sounds, but it can be any stimulus. And it can be any modality, right? It can be, uh, there's one person who only triggers to the smell of orange peel. That's the only trigger. It's still, if they're gonna be exposed to that smell quite often, it can still be extremely distressing in their life. And you find that uh, a low intensity trigger such as a soft baby crying, will elicit the, the typical response. So it doesn't, it doesn't, it can be something that's loud, but it can also, also be something that's very soft. Misophonia is gonna cause emotional dysregulation. They, these, they're intense negative emotions uh, in response to these triggers that are just unavoidable. This rage, this anger, this, sadness, the disgust, it just comes over the person. It is a, a, a emotional reflex. We find that their attention is just completely di diverted to the trigger. If there's a trigger over here, it's like, oh, and their mind is fo totally focused on that. With my granddaughter, she was being triggered by her brother's whistling and we were in a gymnasium and I, I'm a really positive stimulus for my granddaughter. And I got right down and said, hey, Katie, come over, let's do this. Katie, let's go over and look into the kitchen for this. And Katie was just, boom, stop, boom, stop. I mean, there was no way that I could divert her attention away from that trigger. It causes physiological arousal and, and discomfort and distress, especially when it's a prolonged trigger situation. Uh, these individuals are going to want to get away from the triggers and they're going to want to stay away from them. That's your escape and avoidance. But I do want to note that although I explained misophonia as having this physical flinch, you, you rarely will ever see the actual initial physical response that the person is going to have. And they often will, will not be able to describe that response. So, Judge misophonia primarily as an extreme negative response to some common stimulus that as much as the person tries to stay calm, 
and tries to ignore it, they can't. That's misophonia. Okay, so thank you very much. I've been, been very pleased to be able to be here for this eighth and final, at least for now, um, presentation of recognizing misophonia. I'm gonna now open up the, uh, the chat box so that we can see. Oh, I do wanna point out on the slide here, notice there's a diagnosing and assessing misophonia class where there are six CEs available, six continuing education credits available for this. And uh, it's on misophoniainstitute.org is how you get to it. And uh, if the price is too much, make me a deal. We want you to be trained. So we really want to have a lot more individuals trained uh, on, on misophonia. This is part of our professional awareness. And we're happy to have everyone who's not a professional here. But this is our professional part of our professional awareness campaign. Now, I'm going to also open up the microphone to everyone. So if you don't want to be heard, shut off. Mute your microphone. Can you share the most effective modality? Okay, Kristen, great question. Uh, treatment modalities, secret repowdering hypnotherapy, behavioral techniques that I do, uh, use of noise, uh, getting a sound generator and wearing it, uh, getting that from an audiologist, that can be very effective for people. And then there's some work on exposure and stress reduction by at Fordham University by Dean McKay that is showing promising. Again, medication, the only medication that we find is helpful that's been kind of generally reported. There's always one of things, but uh, is that if a person has depression, chronic depression, that's independent of the misophonia, then feeling better um, can get them, again, health and wellness goes up, misophonia severity goes down, Anxiety goes down, misophonia severity goes down. So medications for other, not for misophonia, but for other conditions. Uh, and getting good sleep, eating right, getting exercise, those are positive things that improve health and well-being and therefore reduce misophonia. Okay, I think I did the repeat there, Lisa. Uh, if not, ask a specific question. Okay. What is the background noise? Oh, I will tell you, background noise is anything you want. So here's, for example, here's an app called White Noise by TMSOFT. And here's one of my favorites. This is Floridian waves. So you get the nice sound of the waves coming in and out, fairly steady, great sound. Here's a, here's a let's see. Um, Let's try a, a rainstorm. A little thunder there if you like that. Here is extreme rain. Here is a, a dishwasher, vacuum cleaner, heavy rain pouring, a crowded room, sounds of a city street, a train, pink, pink noise. Could be any sound. Uh, and the thing I like about white noise app, the white noise app lets you make your own mix of sounds. Uh, you want a sound that's soothing and persistent. You don't want to use music because music is da 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 silent end. Trigger, 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 trigger. Okay, next sound starts up. So television music typically have too many uh, silent spots in them. And you, it's better if you can get something with a similar frequency component. So for example, if somebody triggered to the clicking of keyboards, then maybe knowing that having the train ride nice and kind of loud along with a mixture of white noise, I, I couldn't do those together, but that kind of a mix, let's see, I can do a real mix here. Can I, nah, I won't do that. Anyway, having the sound of, maybe some white noise and the clacking, but good clacking, then that could mask the sound of the other triggers. Uh, let's see. Next question. Um, it's our noise question. Okay. Okay. I, yes, I've muted everyone. Um, 
Okay. Sorry about the, the frustration with the mics there. Because we did have a really big group today. Really good group. Okay. Um, okay. So here we have a real question after everyone. Again, I apologize for, for all the, the torture of the background mics. Okay. As someone with misophonia, Lexapro helps me deal with stressors in life and helps me to recover faster from triggers. Good sleep habits also, noise canceling headphones and earplugs, louder background noise at times of eating. Most effective for me is to avoid situations. Since it was named, I stopped beating myself up over it. Acceptance is key. Good advice. Again, those things do not reduce the fundamental reflex of misophonia, they simply make life more bearable, Virginia, right? Well, actually the Lexapro kind of does, right? Caffeine tends to increase the response and no caffeine makes the reflexes smaller and that can help. So those Lexapro avoiding caffeine can help. Um, but the secret repatterning hypnotherapy is trying to reduce the fundamental mostly the emotional explosion reflex and the behavioral work that I do is trying to relate to reduce the conditioned physical response and the emotional response will go down with it. What I've found is that in cases where there's a strong physical response, the emotional response will go down with it quite predictably as the physical response goes down. I have one individual I'm working with. He said he's had misophonia for a long time and he's we're really working good with muscle relaxation and training. And he's relaxing into situations, relaxing. After a trigger, he relaxes because the next, the second, third, and the fourth trigger, he's relaxed for it. And his response, he says, my misophonia is down by at least 70%. So the, the relaxation is, and physical behavioral interventions actually reduce the physical response of misophonia. And uh, I love working with very young children because there are some specific games and activities that we can do that will, that will make a difference. Okay, Yvonne, I can't pronounce your name, uh, likes, likes noise canceling headphones, absolutely. The Bose headphones seem to be the best. Uh, costly, but they're worth it. Um, what is being triggered with leg jiggling? Well, your brain is being triggered. Your ventromedial prefrontal cortex and anterior insula is being triggered. It is a reflex response. And the way these reflexes develop is that you, you see a stimulus and you have a, a, an emotional and physiological response. Like people have said that hair twirling and leg jiggling tends to indicate that somebody's anxious. And because they're anxious, then, oh, I'm a little anxious, or, oh, I'm a little anxious. And now that I'm a little anxious, because I they, they're anxious, I'm anxious, they're anxious, I'm anxious, the brain integrates that visual stimulus with that physical response. And now when you see that phys visual stimulus, it creates that physical response and the emotional explosion. So it's, it's, it's really brain plasticity at its worst, okay? That, that's what drives misophonia. Okay, I find I can, I can be constant, it can be constant motion in your line of sight. Now, you may find that constant motion in your line of sight is a distraction. My daughter developed a trigger to children swinging their legs back and forth like that when they're seated. I know where it happened because her computer is right here and there's an open desktop beside her and she's gonna be catching uh, her daughter's leg swinging out of the peripheral vision, which is annoying, right? She goes, oh, Katie, stop that. That's so annoying. But then she's at church teaching the three-year-olds. She goes, they're swinging their legs. Oh, they're swinging their legs. And she says, wait a minute, they're not doing anything wrong. And she noticed, the muscles in the back of her neck were, were clenching down on her. So that's an example of, of a learned response. And it, so when there's something in your line of sight, 
again, maybe that's not misophonia. Maybe that's just irritating. But if you see that particular thing over and over again, then, and you flinch to it, then you're going to develop that reflex response. And that will be misophonia. Uh, my doctor's never heard of this disorder and looked at you like you're crazy. I'm sorry. That's very common. That's why we're doing this. That's why we're here. And if anybody wants to help, I would like to have the Misophonia Institute to have a booth at the uh, American Psychiatrist Association in San Francisco next May. That costs about $5,000 out of pocket expenses. Maybe not that, maybe only four and a half, but it, it's going to be a lot. Uh, it costs three and a half thousand just to rent the booth. And then you have to pay the workers there required by contract union workers of about probably another five or $600. So uh, actually even more like $800 because you have to pay to have carpet put down. So anyway, it's, it's there. If anybody wants to help support the Misophonia Institute so we can get the, a booth there to help psychiatrists hear about this, I would love to volunteer my time to do that because I live, I live in the San Francisco area. Okay, again, uh, we have the comment about the Lexapro taking the edge off of the triggers. Um, but you still, wait, Lexapro I find only takes the edge off of the triggers, still have a noticeable and up defect. Yeah, it doesn't cure misophonia. Um, okay, so let's see the last one. Uh, females more than males, uh, any synthesis, hypothesis as to why? That's a great question. Actually, we find in my survey that I ran on uh, that thousand people that, that like 80% were females. But if you go onto the Misophonia Facebook websites, 75 to 80% are females. Yet in the study done by Wu and the study done by Cash, males were as often, were as, Misophonia was as common in the males as in the females. So it doesn't develop more often in females, but the severity is greater in females. So why is it, is it individual sensitivity? Is it the women are more emotional than men and men just get pulsed and oh, whatever. Oh, I hate that. And they keep on going where the women maybe get pulsed and, and tend to be to, to tie it in with more emotions and things. So I don't know, I'm not trying to be discriminating there, but women tend to be more sensitive than men, but the reflex develops as often in men as it does in women. Okay, any more questions? If not, I'm gonna say two things. First, I'm gonna say, if you wanna support our work, it costs money to do this, we would love a donation of a dollar, any amount to the Misophonia Institute to help make, to pay for this go to training uh, system, uh, time is not paid for, but uh, would love to have you support our work in awareness, public awareness and professional awareness. And we're getting a little work in, in research. So thank you very much for attending. I'm glad you were able to be here and we'll close the session now. So goodbye everyone.